Summer, 1964. A young Muhammad Ali makes his way across the sacred ground where the battles untold had shaped the fate of the Ashanti kingdom. The Ashanti, the African empire rich in traditions and fables, had one such story that would challenge the champions of all champions. The handsome, sharp-mouthed athlete had been preparing for this. He wrapped his strong boxer hands around the mythical Akrafina sword, the Ashanti Sword of Unity, a sword which had a history that went back three centuries. In 1696, the great sorcerer Akomfo Anokye and co-founder of the Asante Empire was ready to cement his legacy and set his kingdom on a path to glory. He was considered to be the greatest lawgiver and wisest sage of the Asante people in Western Africa. He is known for his reported abilities in healing and regulating nature and for establishing codes of conduct. His knowledge and magic was so strong that he is reported to have been able to redirect the flows of rivers. If one didn't know better, one would think that we were talking about the great ancient being Thought, who gave ancient Egypt the foundations of its civilization. Anoki is believed to have used his strong oratorical skills and considerable intellectual and psychological abilities to influence many of the regional states to unite under Osei Tutu and gain military and political strength, which they could use to confront their enemies. By 1695, Anokia and Osei Tutu had created a capital region, Kumasi, organized the state councils, reorganized the army according to a new martial philosophy, and sworn unity with all minor kings of the region. It was Anokia who was responsible for producing the famed Golden Stool, the unifying symbol of the Asante that established the legal authority of Osei Tutu as the first Asanteheni, king of the new Asante Empire. In addition to their legendary military strategy, the Ashanti had another edge over their enemies. The iron cast sword called the Akrafena, a superbly balanced weapon that gave its warrior swiftness and a devastating blow. Its blade design had evolved from the saber, but its durability in battle coupled with the well-trained Ashanti foot soldier was deadly to all would-be opposers. And so the great priest Akomfo spoke the incantations and drove the famous Afrafina sword into the ground, the very sword wielded by his king Osei Tutu the Great. It was to remain there as a test of the greatness of the Ashanti kingdom. Countless have tried, but none had succeeded in their attempts to remove the Akrafina. But the great Muhammad Ali might. And so, Ali set into position under the scorching African sun, and with all his might, he pulled, for what felt like an eternity. The crowd stood still in awe for a moment, as the champion stood up right with his hands on his waist, But even the great Ali himself could not dislodge the Akrafina, and to this day, no one has been able to. The history of swords often goes hand in hand with the evolution of smelting technology. As soon as humans discovered metals, they started making weapons from it. One of the first metals used for weapons was copper in 4500 BC. Although copper is rust resistant, it is not strong and is easily twisted or broken. Copper is often found in nature and requires very little treatment to fashion into a tool. Humans then improved on copper weapons by creating the bronze alloy. This made weapons much stronger but still soft and brittle. By improving smelting temperatures, we were finally able to make iron weapons. Already in 2000 BC, Nigerians were smelting bronze and iron, giving Africans an early edge in the Iron Age, which they used in remarkable metal carvings that have become iconic. But Africans didn't just use their knowledge for metals in art, they also used it to forge ever more powerful weapons, especially swords. From brass, to bronze, to iron and steel, Africa made ever more sophisticated and often shape-defying swords. Too many to cover in one video, we will see a few notable examples that have shaped some of the continent's greatest empires. Have you hit the like and share button yet? What are you waiting for? Do you need some encouragement from a giant with a sword? We begin in 3100 BC in Kemet, ancient Egypt. One of the earliest African civilizations, the ancient Nubio-Kemetic civilization complex. It made significant advancements in weaponry. Among these, the Kopesh was one of the most distinct. Developed around 2000 BCE during the Middle Kingdom period, 
the kopesh was a curved sword, reminiscent of a sickle. The weapon was typically made from bronze, a testament to the advanced metallurgy skills of ancient Egyptian society. A typical kopesh is 50-60 centimeters, 20-24 inches in length, though smaller examples also exist. The inside curve of the weapon could be used to trap an opponent's arm or to pull an opponent's shield out of the way. These weapons changed from bronze to iron in the New Kingdom period. By far the most recognizable kopesh is Tutankhamun's kopesh. It is stunning in its craftsmanship and beauty, and to think that it dates back to 1300 BC makes it even more mystical. But as mighty and influential as it was, the kopesh had one major drawback. The bronze cast weapon lacked in strength and durability. It was no match for stronger metal-forged weapons. And it is this latter metal that the Africans, lower south in the continent, would start smelting into new deadly weapons. Iron. Iron Age Central and East Africa, 500 BCE, 1400 CE. With the onset of the Iron Age, African societies south of the Sahara began to adopt iron tools and weapons, including swords. The Haya people of modern-day Tanzania, for instance, had developed high-grade carbon steel production by around 2000 BCE, far earlier than much of the rest of the world. This technological capability allowed for the creation of advanced weapons such as long swords. Ethiopian Shotel, 1st century CE, 1974 CE. The Ethiopian Shotel borrows from the Nubio-Kemetic tradition of the Kopesh, but significantly improves on its design and material science, and some sources indicate that it goes as far back as 700 BC. Expert Ethiopian swordsmen were known as Shotelai. Shotelai was an elite warrior class of trained warriors the equivalent of the samurai in Japan, but indigenous to Africa. Shotelai are trained in armed and unarmed combat, and very capable of killing multiple opponents in real combat, as evidenced at Battle of Adawa in 1896, where thousands of Italian soldiers were cut to pieces and killed in close quarters combat by Shotelai and other Ethiopian warriors in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Evidence for the Shotel dates from the earliest Demotions, Damites, and Aksumites, used by both mounted and dismounted warriors. Damot was the pre-Aksumite indigenous Kushite empire situated in modern-day Eritrea. After the Solomonic restoration of Atse Yakuno Amlak I, the resurgent emperors began to re-establish the Aksumite armies. This culminated in the reign of Amda Seyon I. Ethiopian forces were armed with short and long swords, such as the Saif and Gorad. The Shotel swordsmen known as Shotelai and organized in the Aksurarat Shotelai comprised one of the elite forces of Amda Seyon's imperial host. Along with the Harab Ganda and Korem cavalry, Keste Nib archers and Aksuarat Aksuarai lancers were said to be the forces that flew through the air like the eagle and spun on the ground like the avalanche by a contemporaneous historian. Shotel techniques, among others, included hooking attacks both against mounted and dismounted opponents that had devastating effect, especially against mounted cavalry. The Shotel could be used to hook and rip the warrior off the horse. Classically, the Shotel was employed in a dismounted state to hook the opponent by reaching around a shield or any other defensive implement or weapon. The shape is similar to a big sickle and can be effectively used to reach around an opponent's shield and stab them in vital areas such as the kidneys or lungs. It is closely resembled by the Afar gyle. The gyle has two cutting edges, while the Shotel's upper edge is unsharpened and sometimes used braced against the swordsman's shield for strength. The Shotel and other Ethiopian swords are occasionally referred to collectively in G's as Hane. However, the mid-18th century European visitor to Ethiopia, Remedius Prutki, often used the word Shotel to describe a carving knife. Ashanti Sword, the Akrafina. One of the most recognizable swords in the world, the Akrafina had multiple purposes. It was used for war when it would be called the Akrafina, or the Enswafina when it would be used in ceremonial events, mostly by the king and the elite of the Ashanti. The Ashanti did have other symbolic swords, the most famous of which is the Mpampansuo. This was used by the Ashanti Heen, the Ashanti king. Mpampansuo translates to responsibility sword. 
It has to be said that the Ashanti swords are a masterpiece in craftsmanship. Both the heavier handle, used to balance the weight of the sword, and the larger head tip, which increases kinetic energy delivered onto the target, gave the Acrafina a very maneuverable and deadly combo. Bonaman long swords were used primarily by Ashanti cavalry and commanders, not infantry during the 10th to 15th centuries. In the 16th century, and at the time of Denkira, Akiem and Akwamu land warfare consisted mostly of spearmen and bowmen on foot, mounted archers using two-handed bows, and mounted swordsmen with two-handed swords, twin blades. Ashanti swords were not a primary weapon for all Ashanti combat, but were mostly for Ashanti shock attacks, defensive strokes, and close combat. Blades were heavy as they were made of bronze and later iron, and pommels were often knobbed and used as balances. Short swords may have been used in follow-up attacks, as short sword carriers were armored completely and accompanied with a shield. Ashanti Akrafina swords with wooden or metal pommels decorated with beaten gold have featured in Ashanti court regalia since the 17th century AD. 2. Ashanti swords were used during Ashanti wars since the 17th century. The Ashantis were engaged in a series of military conflicts from the 18th century AD between Ashanti city-state military forces and African states and European states up until the 20th century. To further west, there is another empire that used steel cast swords to reign on the Sahel for centuries. The Takuba from Empire of Mali and Songhai, 1235 CE 1591 CE. During the medieval period, West African empires such as Mali and Songhai utilized a variety of swords. Iron, which was plentiful in this region, was the primary material used in weapon construction. An important sword from this era was the Takoba, used predominantly by the Mali Songhai Empire. But the Takuba was also used by other ethnic groups in the region, spanning all the way to Cameroon and Central African Republic. The Takoba was typically a long, straight, and double edged iron sword. The Takuba is a cruciform-style sword often mistaken for a European sword because of its appearance. Despite that, it has some characteristics that are very different to European bladed-edged weapons, the strongest being the large and very broad crossguard. The Takuba is furnished with a straight, double-edged blade, honed on both sides for optimal slashing. The blade tapers forth from the hilt, culminating in a rounded yet keen point. A Takuba's blade generally measures 29 to 33 inches, or 74 to 84 centimeters in length. One notable characteristic of Takuba blades are the fullers, or grooves, that run along the blade's center. These aren't merely for show, but serve a distinct purpose, primarily to reduce the weight of the weapon. More often than not, Takubas bear three fullers, with the central one being the longest. However, variations exist, some sporting five grooves, others bearing a single, notably wide fuller at the center. The first segment of the blade, spanning approximately 8 to 12 inches or 20 to 30 centimeters from the hilt, remains unsharpened, forming what is known as a ricasso. Considering the Takuba's association with the upper crust of society, this ricasso is frequently adorned with decorative embellishments. The intricate designs of the Takuba scabbards differ because of the large area and clan diversity, but they nonetheless retain that elegant form and weight-high double hook function. Like John Acton said, and I quote, history is not a burden on the memory, but an illumination of the soul, end quote. We will leave you with pictures of a few notable African swords. There are so many other swords from Africa that it is hard to nail down just four for this video.
I will, however, give a shout-out to Damon Stith's YouTube channel that focuses on African swords, martial arts, and swordsmithing. Join us and see how those who are said to be without history birthed civilization itself. <laughs>